Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. Um, how did I know I wanted to keep it real? Because the cost of faking it until you make it is is expensive and painful. You no, know, I went downstairs and told my kid, I'm like, the Oprah team just called. And my kid's like, well, cool. But you know what? The toilet's clogged downstairs. <laughs> so can you come and do something about this? And like real life is always happening. You know, that's my definition of holistic, right? I want to serve and I want to prosper. I want to talk about consciousness and I want to make cash. What's up, guys? Xavier Katana here, and wow, we have such an amazing interview with Danielle Laporte and on her new book, White Hot Truth, Clarity for Keeping It Real on Your Spiritual Path from One Seeker to Another. You guys will love this. This is a fresh interview. You know, we get into some things that people have talked about, but I love Danielle's authenticness and her realness and her rawness. This was super informative. You will find it highly empowering. Thank you guys so much for listening. The Human Experience is in session. My guest today is Mrs. Danielle Laporte. Danielle, it's a pleasure. Welcome to HXP. Mm, Thank you. Danielle, so, you know, I I like to do this thing where I'm just radically honest with my guests. We have a content director here that brings new guests onto the show. And, you know, before her mentioning you to me, I had no idea who you were. So can you tell us briefly who you are and what you do, please? Well, what I'm most well known for at this place in time is a book I wrote called The Desire Map, which is all about a more holistic approach to goal setting, what I call goals with soul. Before that, I wrote a book called The Firestarter Sessions. And I'm most interested in conversations around creativity and consciousness. I'm a mother. I live in Vancouver. I have a pretty much women-led, women-run business. Yeah, that's, that's me. That's the nutshell version of me. Your biography gives you some different labels, you know, entrepreneur, prominent writer, speaker, think tank executive, and you never went to college. I mean, so how do those labels fit into who you are? Well, I'm, I'm all those things. I am a speaker. I feel close to life when I'm on stage as part of me being of service. I consider myself a seeker who writes. Yeah, that's all truth. It's all accurate. You know, I got a chance to read your book last night. And I actually really enjoyed it. I like your writing style. I like the way that you formatted the book. You know, there's something on the front, sort of the subtitle of your book, which says, Clarity for Keeping It Real on Your Spiritual Path from One Seeker to Another. When did you find out that you were a seeker? And when did you, how did you decide you wanted to keep it real? (laughs) Well, I think I was born a seeker and that I didn't fall asleep. So, I mean, that... The craving to know how life works, to feel closer to whatever the creative force is, has always been there. It was there in wanting to write when I was little. It was there in feeling like I had some connection to whether it was like kids on the playground or angelic forces. So born this way, did not shut down, have always been seeking, will always seek. Um, How did I know I wanted to keep it real? Because the cost of faking it until you make it is expensive and painful. When you're off track or you put yourself in situations where you decide, you know, to survive, you're going to be inauthentic. You know, you learn that showing up as who you are is really the solution. When did you start this process of showing people how to find themselves, guide their lives? Where did that happen for you? You know, it it showed up in my first real job was working at the body shop in Toronto and, you know, it was a global organization and I was pumping foot cream in the stores and still having talks with people about, you know, what they were going to do in their relationships. And then when I got into a management position or a place of leadership, you know, the conversation expanded into 
bringing your whole self to the workplace and how you could really be you. And, you know, those were the days when social responsibility was a fresh term. So that was always there. So it's not so much a when, it's just how it showed up. And it's always been showing up. And now it's a platform that I stand in. I'm really, I'm committed to being of service. I want to make my money in a meaningful way. If I can alleviate suffering in some way, I'm going to use my talents to do that. You know, that's my definition of holistic, right? I want to serve and I want to prosper. I want to talk about consciousness and I want to make cash. You know, I'm highly introverted, but when I'm out, I'm out and I'm present. So yeah, it's uh, it's always been there. Okay, I get that. I can dig that. I feel like people have this misrepresentation of success they see the sort of end result of success they see Mm. they don't see the hard work and the failures so have you at any point felt like okay i've made it this is the point you're sitting down with oprah maybe that was the moment where you just felt i've made it I'm, i'm starting to do what what i love to do this is it you know when the production team for oprah calls you that's pretty cool but then real life happens i mean one of the days that Oprah staff got in touch with me. You know, I went downstairs and told my kid, I'm like, Oprah team just called. And my kid's like, well, cool. But you know what? The toilet's clogged downstairs. <laughs> but can you come and do something about this? Like real life is always happening. There's those times, like the first times when I would get recognized on the street and people would come up to me. I get a lot of gratitude for like an idea that apparently changed somebody's life. So being recognized is definitely a moment. Like a big one was I was in O'Hare Airport and I was running to catch a plane. I think I was in between gigs or something. Mm -hmm. I was getting a juice and somebody in line said, oh my God, that's like the Danielle Laporte voice. (laughs) You must be. And I just thought, wow, like my voice is getting recognized. So yeah, those are fun moments. And you never, at least I don't feel like I've arrived, like There's always somewhere to be tomorrow. There's, I want to keep going and keep growing. So yeah, there's fun moments. You tell your friends like, God, I feel like I made it. And the next day it's the next thing. Yeah. Do you think that's an ego type process where you're kind of always pushing for the the next thing, as you said? Well, I think, you know, that's, it's a great question and it can be an ego type thing or it can be a really divinely guided thing. So I prefer to refer to it as this divine dissatisfaction. I'm always going to want to create. I am a maker. I'm always going to want to make. But today, I'm going to rest in the complete gratitude and the respect and like the total appreciation about what has showed up for me and what I've done to help it show up. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes, yeah, it can be, it's what the Buddhists call the hungry ghost. Yeah. You're never satisfied. Yeah. It's never enough. You can't impress enough people. You can get 99 fantastic comments on something and one negative comment. It's that negative comment that sticks with you. You're running all the time and you will continue to run endlessly and eventually burn yourself out. And you get really clear on who you're trying to impress. And there can be a really positive or a really dark answer to that. One of my core tenets is that you're not actually chasing the goal. You are chasing the feeling you want to have when you reach that goal. It's best to get clear on the feelings you want to feel what I call your core desired feelings. And when you're clear on that, then you come up with your quarterly objectives. Then you come up with your bucket list. And then you assess all the goals you have and you figure out if what you're going after is really what you need to go after for like your whole success, your soulful success. Because a lot of us are just on achievement autopilot Hmm. and just trying to fix a wound, trying to get our dad to finally say he's proud of us. It's approval to to bandage some some hurt that we have. You can't keep on that track. You're going to fry out. You're going to end up on Prozac. It's not sustainable. In the examples that you've seen with people that come to you for advice, where do you see that expectations can be problematic? Do you see that people sort of set themselves up for failure? You know, it depends. So to the first part of your question how can expectations be problematic? Well, they can be really problematic and they can be incredibly useful. You know, my learning is that the trick with wanting something, the trick with desire is to really want it with your whole heart, to have as much belief as you possibly can muster 
in deserving it. It's not going to come to you if you think you don't deserve it. And then you're going to try and meet the universe halfway. You're going to do your work, you know, really show up to make it happen, but you got to let it go. And it's really paradoxical, like want what I want with all my heart, but have no expectations. Yeah. And I'm not talking about having no expectations and like, you know, let people treat you like shit or, you know, lower your standards. That's not what it's about. But you have to leave lots of room for mystery and how things are going to show up in your life. This is part of the power of being really connected with how you want to feel because lots of things can come your way. Jobs and relationships. You know, it's not exactly how we had it on our vision board. It's not exactly what we thought, but they make us feel the way we want to feel. And, you know, the fulfillment is there. So expectations, they're messy and they're tricky and they create a lot of suffering. And when they're used in the right, like, dose, you know, having expectations can really set the tone for things. That's where expectations become more like standards, you know? Yeah. You know, I have high standards. And that creates this rhythm. It creates this quality to my life. Has there been a moment where you're just like, oh, I'm kind of sick of the self-help thing. Like, it, it <laughs> yeah. feels like narcissism and I'm just done doing it. And I'm just, I'm just done with it. Has, how many times has that happened to you? Well, it's not about how many times. It's about the degree, the intensity. So yeah, it's why I wrote White Hot Truth. You know, it was about feeling tired of trying to be better, like constant self-improvement. That's where I had to ask the question, like, who am I trying to impress? You know, my spirituality had become another thing on my to-do list. It's like therapy and juicing and yoga and, and you know, the long list. I wouldn't say I hit the wall, but I say I got weary enough to have some breakthrough thinking around trying to get better at being better. It is the big theme for me in my life right now. You advise your readers to create something called a stop doing list. What is a stop doing list and why is having a stop doing list such an important thing? Because we're all doing things that we don't need to be doing that are self-sabotaging, that are wasteful in terms of all kinds of resources that we're doing for the wrong reasons. And I think what you stop doing in terms of what you're going after is just as important as all the new habits that everybody in the self-help space is telling you that you need. You know, you want good things to come into your life, you got to clear the decks. You want to be strategic and mindful, you have to clear your mind. You want to create new habits, you have to stop doing the old habitual stuff. Once or twice a year, like I really consciously and intentionally think of what I'm going to stop doing. And as it kind of naturally happens, usually <laughs> there's this new phase of like, there's more requests and there's more demands and there's more travel and there's more things that I want to do. And there's the next book and the next product and all that. And I feel like I'm heading towards being maxed out. Take a breath. What goes on the stop doing list now? You know, it's like... Mm. Stop staying up too late. Stop doing particular kind of interviews. Stop taking a red eye flight. You stop trying to get it right for everybody's birthday. It's a cleansing. I really it's essential. Like that. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to borrow that. Um, you can just have it. You don't even have to steal it. You can have it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, you know, we talked about this sort of climb to success and Oprah calling you. Where was the moment where you were just burnout or just bottom? I, one of those two and where you just felt like, okay, you know, maybe, maybe I'll turn around. Maybe I'll do something else. Well, the revelation around being fried from a lot of self-improvement happened sort of midway through my divorce. So there's lots going on. There's lots of life repair and things falling apart with that. That was a really big gaha for me of just like, is everything I'm doing to be well and good, really helping me to be well and good? And the answer was no, not, not all of it. Some of this is punishing. And a lot of this is taking up the time. I want to do things that really heal me and really make me feel like myself. I want the space and time in my life to be with my friends, not necessarily my therapist. I want the space and time in my life to make what I make, like creating, being of service is fulfilling and it's healing. And it's, you know, it's so much the answer, but 
yeah, I need space to do that. You know, at the end of the day, this is all about you being your own guru, right? Like yeah. referring to yourself, not necessarily the coach, not necessarily the guy on Instagram with the big Facebook following is telling you all the time to just feel the fear and do it anyway. It's like <laughs> you feeling what you need to feel and then deciding if you're going to do it or not. Yeah. Yeah, that makes so much more sense than just what you said before. You know, that is a great segue into something that I really want to touch on because it, I think what connected with me the most from reading your book was some of the spiritual practices that people just kind of adhere to or kind of live by. Like there's a chapter in your book called Open Gentle Heart Big Bucking Fence Boundaries for Spiritual People. So, how do we create boundaries that work? They're hard to create. So I think if everybody just has that recognition that it's not necessarily easy for a lot of people, it's like it's a new muscle that they have to exercise. I mean, women are especially good at not having boundaries. It's a whole new territory, putting up your big fucking fence. So just knowing that sort of helps you do the work that needs to be done. When you start to put up boundaries for yourself, and I mean, th this can be everything from like, you know, the self-regulated boundaries where, you know, you're not going to check your email after nine o'clock at night, or it's the boundaries where, you know, you're not going to do that exercise in the group workshop, or you're not going to go home for the holidays, or you're not going to see your ex anymore, or whatever those are. Sometimes we go overboard. And it's like we quit things and we, we put up huge stop gaps in place when really we just need to just say, you know, I, I don't want to work 60 hours a week <laughs> instead of just quitting, right? So sometimes we go overboard. Boundaries are something that need to be declared most of the time. They're not just quietly held practices. You know, you have to tell the world how to treat you, as Maya Angelou said. So, And that's where the hard work really comes in where you say, look, this doesn't work for me anymore, or this is what works for me, or this is how I want to do it. This is how I want to be talked to. The reason it's difficult is because everybody wants to be loved. Most of us want connection. And there's, and there's a, a huge, huge threat, threat that, that, that we're going to be disconnected, disconnected and, and disliked and thought, and thought of, of as bitchy, bitchy or diva or, diva or douchey, douchey if, if we have, have boundaries, boundaries in place. place. But that's, that's actually... Not your, not your problem, problem to be concerned, concerned about, about if other, if other people, people don't, don't like your boundaries. boundaries. Self-respect is, you know, you taking care of yourself in that way. And there's a difference between boundaries and barriers. So I think the best metaphor for this is that boundaries are like the big fucking fence you mentioned. You've made your declaration. So people are, you know, give or take, people are going to respect that. You have some peace of mind. You can, you can chill, right? Whereas barriers are kind of like fake boundaries and we haven't really made a declaration. So we're just kind of like, we're just guarded and we're walking around thinking, you know, like, don't fuck with me and don't ask me to work overtime and don't talk to me like that. Hmm. But there hasn't been like this healthy expression. Mm -hmm. You end up exerting a lot of energy waiting to maybe be attacked, maybe have someone cross your so-called boundaries, you know, mm -hmm. but boundaries are much harder work. I just want some more clarity on this because how does a person keep an open mind, an open framework, and have healthy boundaries at, at the same time? So say more about what you mean about that. What do you mean an open mind and healthy boundaries? Let's say that there is a person that is experiencing this sort of looping event where they keep experiencing the same things over and over. Let's say that they're in unhealthy relationship after unhealthy relationship and they're just meeting all the wrong people. And as much as they try to shift what they're doing or shift how they're thinking, it just doesn't work. Like, where do you see it not working there? I see what you're saying. Okay, so it's about a pattern. So first of all, I mean, in this question, we have to figure out like what the pattern is. Okay. So lots, there's lots of different ways to go wrong. You keep attracting people who don't respect your boundaries. Well, in this case, in the boundary conversation, it's mostly probably your problem because the world does treat you how you ask the world to treat you. And people are going to try and push you and disrespect you. If you're attracting that over and over again, there's something I think that you're not being clear enough about. You're not declaring. And it probably, you know, not to get super therapeutic about this, mm -hmm. but it probably goes right back to your own self-worth. 
on some level, you still aren't believing that you're worth respect. You're worthy of your desires. So yeah, I think if you're attracting stampeders, then it gets back to you not feeling really worthy. Oh, see, I, I really enjoy that. I, I don't think I've heard someone explain it quite like that before. So I really appreciate the fresh perspective. Let's talk about being the guru. Let's talk about how we own that power and realize that you know, we are our own gurus. Please explain mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. us how we do that. Well, this is the point, and it can take your whole lifetime. I think it could take multiple lifetimes. I mean, this has been my own experience. In order for me to get to my own self-agency and my own power, my own clarity, I had to fall for a lot of shit. And when you wake up and you realize you know, that you sold yourself short or you kind of got hoodwinked by a healer or a teacher or a partner or a boss or whatever, you know, you fell. When you wake up and you realize you fell for it, if you're on the path of wanting to be more awake and self-actualized, normally what happens after that is you really get down on yourself. You're just like, how could I have done that? I'm like such a new age loser. I must be weak. I must be defective. Why? How did I miss that? But actually, I think that's where the first really important reframe needs to happen, which is instead of feeling like you're a loser because you got off track, you have to declare that that was an initiation. That's part of the passage of me waking up and realizing there's a different kind of truth and it's over here. This is about learning to be discerning. And you can't learn to be discerning unless you buy a lot of lies along the way. So it's part of it. And so you question, like, do I need a do I need a coach? Do I need a therapist? The answer sometimes is yes, like maybe forever, you know, or at certain times in your life. Do I need all these tools, all these things I've been relying on? Do I need my mastermind group? <laughs> do I need my drumming circle? And when you decide to do that and kind of cleanse and start looking to yourself some more, then the next phase comes and you get a little freaked out. And you know, the big decision comes. Should I sign this contract? Should I go? Should I say yes to this person? Should I do this? Should I buy? Should I sell? You're going to want to refer and defer to somebody else. And that's where you like hold tight. It's like you don't go get a fix. Like an objective sort of perspective. Is that what you mean? No. Well, just your perspective. Nobody else's perspective. Okay. You're going to, it's like, it's your call. It's your call. And there are people that I go to and say, what would you do? What would you do if you were me? But the bottom line is it's me. It's me making the decision. And I, you know, whether I'm right or wrong about it, whether I do the best thing or the worst thing, I want to make it because it was my call. It was my intuition, not because I want to make somebody else feel right. Mm -hmm. So even if it's a fail, I'm still building my muscle in discernment, clarity, and intuition and power. Love it. You know, that's what everybody's talking about when they say the answer lies within. So I have fewer sources, let's say, (laughs) that I look to for guidance. Hmm. More me. And so far, so good. I haven't severely fucked up, you know? Like, turns out I really can be the master of my own domain. (laughs) So, working out so far. Oh, man, I love that. That's so refreshing. I find your radical honesty to be really, really, truly amazing. You know, everything that we've been talking about is so very empowering, building boundaries and and learning how to sort of trust yourself. Has there been a moment where you've kind of wanted to go in a certain direction and then your your intuition or something internally is just, it's like a wall and there's Mm -hmm, no mm -hmm. way forward from that. Have you been in that situation before? Oh yeah, many situations. I have had major publishing deals that I have walked away from. There's been a number of contracts in various situations where you're building visions of the future and I have just couldn't sign. It wasn't working. It wasn't didn't feel right in my body. I was really clear. This is not how I want to feel. I'm not moving ahead. You know, I've been offered TV shows. I'm like, you know, what it takes to do a TV show is not the lifestyle I want to have. I've been in business with people who I thought would take my career to the next level and that if I parted ways with them could really be damaging for me, but it wasn't in integrity to stay. And, you know, those walk away moments, those I'm not signing or you're fired or 
I'm, you know, I'm leaving. Mm. Those are defining. Those are defining moments. Everybody's got intuition. Doesn't mean it's easy to follow. Sometimes it will take all of the courage you have. You will disappoint people. You will risk money. You will leave money on the table. The times I have done that and done the hard work to say no, they brought me to the next level. You know, the right person has showed up the day later. Mm, yeah, yeah. We made twice as much money on the next deal. Or, you know, sometimes magical things didn't happen, but myself and my whole team, relieved, free, happy, lighter, way more better. <laughs> Folks, Xavier Katana here, and you have been listening to Danielle Laporte. To hear the rest of this interview, get to thehumanxp.com slash members, where you can hear the rest of Danielle's strategies. You can hear more of what she has to say. It also helps us sustain what we're doing. We don't have to get sponsors this way, and it just keeps everything here going. So if you believe in what we're doing, you will hear something like this. You're hooped. You're hooped. You're out of integrity. You're lying to yourself and to your market. You need to be out about your approach to life and your world paradigm. Suffering does not mean necessarily that you're doing anything wrong. It's part of life. If you want to win, you're going to lose on the way. That is part of something that you will get access to when you become a member of the human experience. So thehumanxp.com slash members. Thank you guys so much for listening.